Hey folks, this video is for lab number four in CSE 1322. And so this week we are going to talk about inheritance and we're going to talk about generating UML diagrams for your classes that you're creating. Um, so today we're going to start off uh, as usual with a blank uh, IntelliJ window. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what would happen if you have a parent class and then some children classes underneath it that inherit from that parent. So what we're going to start off by doing is I'm going to create a new class called person. I'm going to do that using the new Java class as usual. And so we have class person. So let's talk about things that a person might have. It probably has a private, well, let's make it public, um, string name. And a person may have a private int age. Usually you store ages as ints, unless you're four and a half. Um, and then we might have a method, which is the daily routine that this person does. So that's going to be public void uh, daily routine. And uh, I guess what this person is going to do They're going to get up, then they're going to um, watch cartoons, and then they're going to go to sleep. All right, so very exciting daily routine. <laughs> so this is our parent class. Um, there's nothing that makes this a parent class. It's just a class like any other class that we've ever made. But what we're going to do is we're going to create some children of this class. So I'm going to do another new Java class. And this one is going to be a student. So we know that students are people. Um, I think sometimes we forget that, but they are people. Um, and so therefore they should inherit all of the abilities and all of the capabilities of a person, but they will have other things that they specifically keep track of themselves. So for example, a student has a name. I don't have to create another name attribute in here. It's already there because it's going to be an extension of person. All right, so first off, how do we make something an extension? So it says public class student, and I'm going to add to that extends person. Okay, by adding extends person, what I'm doing is I'm saying everything that the person has, which is their name, their age, and their daily routine, I now have, but I may be able to add other things to that. So for example, I may have a private int KSUID. Um, and as a student, I might have a major, so private string major. Right? Now, does a student have the same daily routine as a person? I mean, probably, yes, but we're going to say that a student takes some time to go to class and study in between watching cartoons. So I have inherited this method from person, the daily routine. I already have access to that method. But I might want to change that method, and that means that I might want to override that method. So let's start off and go over to our main here, and let's create a student and a person. So person, we'll call it P1 gets new person. All right, and then we're going to make a student, S1, which is a new student. All right, so this creates for me two people. Now, if I were to run daily routine on P1, we know what's going to happen here, which is that it's going to print out. Um, it's going to tell me that daily routine cannot resolve because, did I spell it wrong? I probably spelled it wrong. See, now this is why you should always use tab complete. Yes, routing. Daily routine. <laughs> All right, let's let it finish it off. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and run that again. So what we're going to see is that I get get up, watch cartoons, go to sleep. That's not surprising because P1 is a person and a person has a daily routine. What may be surprising is that I can also say S1.daily routine. Now, the reason that that's surprising, I'm just going to comment out the, the P1 daily routine, so now only the S1 daily routine runs, is I'm going to get the exact same output. And the reason for that is because S1, which is a student, has inherited from its parent a daily routine. So this method, even though it's only here in person, is actually secretly here also in student. The student has gained access to it because the student is a extension of person. It has all of that same stuff. Likewise, I could actually access the name in the student. So let's go ahead and set this student's name. So I'm going to say s1.name is equal to enda. 
Okay, and the reason that I'm able to do that again, let's look, S1 is a student. Student does not have a name in here, but it's an extension of person and person has a name. Therefore, student does have a name. So I'm able to set that. And we'll always get the same output here because the method doesn't really do anything different. Okay, so the key points of inheritance are, in order to make a class inherit from another class, you're going to use the extends keyword. You simply say it extends this other one. The moment you do that, all attributes and methods that are public in the parent are available to the child without having to redefine them. As a matter of fact, you don't want to redefine them most of the time, you just want to inherit them. And then the child has the ability to be instantiated just like the parent, and this is what I mean by instantiated, making an object of that class. And that class then has access to all of the public attributes and methods that the parent had. And that's why I'm able to call daily routine and name. Just one point of clarification here. Age is listed as private in person. So would I be able to change the age in here? I'm going to add a constructor into student. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the name equal to Fred. Okay. Now, this is kind of goofy because, again, you can't directly see in student that there is a name attribute, but it's letting me set it because it refers to the name that's in person. As a matter of fact, you can see that the IDE is giving me a hint here. When I mouse over it, it says public string name is in company com person, which is the parent class, and I am able to set that. But I cannot set the age. All right, now why is it that I can't set the age? Well, the age is marked as private. And what private means is only the parent can change that or see it. The student has no access to that. So this is going to give me a compile error, and the error is going to be something along the lines of age has private access in person. You cannot do that. So if I wanted to change the age of the student, what I would need to have is a method here in person that was public that allowed me to do it. So we need a getter or a setter. Getter or a setter. So again, you could see that we might have a public void set age which takes in an int new age, and then that would have age equals new age. Okay, and now in student, I can't say age equals 15, but I certainly can say set age, and then pass it the number 15. I can call that method because that's allowed, and that will set the age in the parent. So now when I run this, I get no more compile errors, and everything looks like it should. All right, so that's the basics of inheritance. It's taking everything that your parent has created and allowing you as the child to access it or to change it or to call methods that are public in your parent. What happens if the child doesn't want to be the same as the parent? Sometimes you look at your parents as a cautionary tale as to what not to do. So in that case, what we're going to do is we would have the child override or change the definition of something that it got from its parent. So right now, the only method that we really got from the parent was daily routine. And as I said, without defining it in the student, it is automatically there and it just behaves the same as the parent's daily routine. But if the student wants to have its own version, you would say override, and then you would say public void daily routine. All right, let me make sure that's what I did. It was public void daily routine. If you're going to override a method, the method header must match exactly as it did before. So the return type must be the same and the number of parameters must be the same. All right, so instead of doing what the parent does, now what I'm gonna do is wake up. Study. And we have go to class. Okay, so now the parent has one version of daily routine and the child, the student, has another version. So if I run this, my main method creates a student and then calls daily routine. And you notice that I now get the student's version of it. If I uncomment this out, and I just put in a print statement here so that we can see um, uh, the, um, the difference between the two. When I run this, I'm going to get the parent's version, 
because I'm going to do daily routine on parent, which is get up, watch cartoons, go to sleep. And then I'm going to see the parents or the students version, which is wake up, study, go to class and sleep. So that's the idea of an overwrite. Um, once again, I mentioned that this is an optional word in Java. You don't have to put the overwrite here. It will compile either way. The reason that it's good to put that there is because if you put it here, the compiler is able to check that this actually is successfully an overwrite. If you don't put it here, you could accidentally make a mistake that wouldn't be caught by the compiler. So for example, now I have a new method called daily x routine because of a typo, and the parent's daily routine is still what I get when I call daily routine on the child because I didn't successfully overwrite it. So if you mean to overwrite it, you should put in the add override keyword, which tells it to go ahead and check that this is correct. Because if, now if I put the X in there, I'm actually going to get a compile error that says the method does not overwrite or implement a method from its super type. So if you think this is an overwrite, it's not. That's not working. You didn't do it correctly. But that's only possible because of that overwrite keyword. OK, so those are the first two topics, which is inheritance, talking about being able to access individual attributes and methods that you get from your parent that were public, and then being able to override anything that you don't like as a child. The final part of this lab asks you to generate a UML diagram. UML diagrams are nice, neat ways of looking at all of your classes because it can get a little bit confusing as you add more and more classes. So I'm just going to throw in another class here which is going to be employee, and I'm going to also have it extend um, person. And then in here, I'm just going to put in an employee ID. All right, and then finally, I'm going to add one more class, and I'm going to have undergrad, and it's going to extend student. So now I have a total of four classes. I have person, then I have employee, student, and undergrad. And undergrad is a child of student, student is a child of person, employee is a child of person. But as you can see, this is quickly getting confusing. Um, if you can imagine, a game might have thousands of classes, and it's hard to keep track of which ones are children, which ones, and whatnot. So this is where a UML diagram comes in really handy. If you're in IntelliJ, the first thing you're going to want to do is install the UML diagram tool. You can tell if it's already there by looking on the right-hand side over here. You can see I have a UML design tool window. It may be somewhere further up or down on your list, but if it's there at all, then you have it already. If it's not there, what you're going to need to do is click on File, Settings, and then go to Plugins. And under Plugins, you're going to want to type in the search box UML, and that's going to bring you to UML Design Tool Plugin. Hit Install on that, and then Acknowledge and Yes and Apply. And then once you have done that, this window should open. Initially, it'll be blank, but if you hit this blue button up here, it's going to draw you a UML diagram. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drag this out here real quick and make it bigger so that we can see what's going on. So there's lots going on in here, and I'm just going to take this and move it. You can drag around any of the boxes individually, um, and sometimes that's going to make a lot of sense. So let's see. That probably makes more sense there. And that probably makes more sense there. And this probably should be over here. And then we have our main over there. All right, so what this is showing you is, don't worry too much about this stuff over here where you have Java language string and int. Those are just relationships that it's showing you that all of these classes are using. But what it did was it drew for me person, student, employee, and undergrad. And you can see that each of those, it gave me the attributes. So it says age, which is an int. And the neat thing here is it put a negative sign in front of it, which implies that age is private. Whereas the plus sign here says name is public in person. And if I grab that and just move that window over a little bit so that we can actually see this, and I bring back up the code for person, you can see that's correct. There is my public string name, and there is my private int age. So that's correct. It also shows there are two methods, set age, which is public, and returns a void, takes in an age and daily routine, which is a void. And so those are the two methods in here. And then for student, it shows that student extends person. You can see that's what that arrow implies. Anytime you have an arrow, that's going to be a inherit arrow or an extends arrow. And then you can see that employee is also a child of person. And then finally down at the bottom, undergrad is a 
child of student and it has nothing else in it. So basically a UML diagram, you're going to have one box for every class. The name of the class is going to be at the top. You're going to have any attributes listed. Then you're going to have all the methods listed. You'll notice that in student, it doesn't draw anything that it inherited from the parent if it's not overridden. So it does show daily routine here, but that's because I overrode daily routine. It does not show set age, even though the child, the student, and even the undergrad have the ability to call set age because it was public, it would be inherited all the way down the, tra the chain. All right, so that's a UML diagram. Um, what you would do then is you would export that out as a um, PDF and that gets turned in along with your classes this week. So that's the summary for lab number four. Um, hope you guys have some fun with inheritance and I will see you guys next week.